Wow, what good news. Thank you, worship team, for helping to usher us into, again, this good news, the, the, the shaping reality, the life-shaping reality of Jesus. And, and uh, also to help us continue in that, we have an uh, uh, adv- Advent time spotlight. So you can go ahead and have a seat. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, excited to help us walk through this time, this, this theme this week, which is peace. We have, uh, we have the Crosby family who's going to come up and share with us. So uh, go ahead and make your way up here. And why don't you all help me uh, welcome up the, the, the Crosby family. And so as they, as they make their way up here, again, let me, let me share how this works each week. We, we pause before the time of the, the sermon, of hearing the gospel preached to us. Um, we, we walk through, the church has historically done this, walk through a different theme um, of this Advent, which means arrival. So while we remember the first coming, the first arrival of Jesus, and anticipate his second coming, when he will arrive again once and for all, we walk through a different theme. Last week was hope, and this week is peace. So Crosby family, why don't you go ahead and uh, it's on and everything. So why don't they'll unpause you, unmute you. You're muted, day of the control. So, so will you please introduce yourselves and then share with us what peace has looked like and how that has shaped you and your family? Sure. So hello, everybody. My name is Corey. Uh, this is Jesse. As you can see, we have three kids under four here. This is Lincoln. Uh, Caden right here, and baby Silas is about four months old. So, uh, peace in this season. <laughs> it's a couple of funny stories uh, we'll work in, but uh, on the outside, our life feels pretty chaotic right now. Um, keeping up <laughs> every time. Um, uh, keeping up with these guys has work. Uh, I, I was joking with Jesse, like, parenting is like camping. It's like if you look back fondly and we're like, yeah, that camping trip was so fun, but really you were cold and hungry the whole time. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, a couple, a couple stories to walk you through. We did a family photo shoot a couple weeks ago, um, and Caden decided to rub up against some cactus, take off his shirt. Uh, Lincoln decided to collect rocks and put them in his mom's pocket. And so the Christmas card you'll be receiving from us this year is going to be heavily, heavily photoshopped. (laughs) (laughs) And then, I mean, in divine providence, the bathrooms don't work today, right? Yeah. I have the only two-year-old who needs to poop, right? (laughs) Maybe not the only one. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, this is where we're at. So on the outside, very chaotic. Every day's a journey. Um, But then on contrast to that, exploring the topic of peace. Uh, And specifically, we have peace with with God, as Romans. uh, As Romans says, right? (laughs) Romans 5.1, right? We're justified by faith uh, in having, through Christ, and now we have peace. That should be, it's funny, I'm not emotional, and she said I was going to cry. It's good, it's good. Uh, (laughs) I love it. When it happens. Every time you speak. <laughs> Every I love time. It. It's the spirit. <laughs> Every time, yeah. Um, and that should be enough for us to dance, right? We have peace mm. with our creator. Amen. And out of that, that's a promise for peace in two other domains, uh, ultimately. That's peace with creation. Um, so we have war. We have bad weather, political tension, mm. right? Ultimately, there's going to be peace. Yeah. <laughs> and then peace with each other, mm. right? Family, family bonds, broken families. Ultimately, peace with each other. And that's pretty much all I got to say there. <laughs> uh, amen. amen. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for your vulnerability. Uh, your, your, your. Um, your durability as a family, the, uh, you guys are just a, a consistent source of en- encouragement to myself, to so many others. Uh, Corey, 
leads the main, men's main ministry here at Redemption and really has put a lot of thought and prayer and, and even has been building a, a team and inviting other men into it. And uh, I know our we're, we've talked about we're trying to catch up with the women's ministry. They rock solid and have been for years. And uh, I know, though, our church will be massively blessed as, as men more and more learn what it looks like to be Christ-like in all of life. Amen. And so uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, now will you go ahead and, and light the peace candle and uh, for us right here. Okay. Get ready, Lincoln. Nice job. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Crosby family. And now, um, church, will you stand with me as we read God's word uh, together? Today's scripture is Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our father, fathers, Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right, church, let's also let's, uh, thank the Crosby family again. Good morning. Let me get settled in here. Uh, my name is Marcus, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm not checking my messages. I'm just making sure airplane mode is on and my timer is on. <laughs> timer is important to me because sometimes I can talk and talk and talk. <laughs> that, this, that's what pastors do, I suppose. I will uh, let you know up front that uh, the space that I'm occupying now, the 30 minutes that I will spend uh, talking to you, hopefully less than 30 minutes, uh, talking about the word, preaching, teaching, rebuking, encouraging, all those things that God's word does to all of us, um, I have been tasked to do by a calling that God has placed on my life that I recognize sometimes I, I feel like too late in my life. Um, but I'm glad I did. James chapter 3, verse 1, I always say, uh, urges us, cautions us, people who preach will be judged more harshly, uh, more strictly by God. So one of these days, when I breathe my last breath on this earth, I will stand before the Lord and give account uh, to him for what I'm about to do. I take that very seriously, very significantly, the call on my life to preach the gospel and not to be afraid of anyone and courageously do that. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for just your glory, your grace, your mercy, your plans, what you have done from the beginning of the foundations of this world, creating each and every one of us to love you. Heavenly Father, creating a path that crushes sin, and welcomes, welcomes us into your presence. Lord, we are so fickle at times as humans, but God, you are a rock. And we stand upon you, and you make us saints despite our sinfulness. I pray that you use my words this morning to move in the hearts of those present in this room and those who will watch later on. I am so grateful to be alive. So grateful 
to be able to share life with these people in the city of Tucson. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Whenever people meet me for the first time, they always say, man, sometimes that guy seems too intense, <laughs> too serious. Those of you who know me, you know I have a sense of humor that I'm not aware of. It just kind of happens. Um, in your life, this time of year, have you ever waited on something or someone that never arrived? Is there, is there a point in life where you can think of that you were promised something and you waited and it never came? Waiting on something or for so long that you did not get. An event that did not happen. It's frustrating when our feelings and our expectations are not met, right? When you've waited, and in this season, some of us are dropping hints as we speak, giving clues, insinuating, hey, this is what I want for Christmas. Backdooring it, trying to get, get it through so that you're not disappointed on that morning, right? This time of year is classic for this. Christmas is coming. When I was a boy, for as long as I could remember, I wanted a bicycle, I was desperate for a bicycle. Now, I grew up in West Africa, where we lived, had one road. It was a two-lane road that people drove faster than they should have. It was right in front of my house, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't a highway, but to American standards, but it was a highway in my neighborhood. And we were one of the few people that lived in that neighborhood at the time. We were surrounded by bushes, and I wanted a, bi I wanted a bike. Everything else was sand. The only road that I could have ridden a bike on was the road that was in front of my house that was really busy. And every day my dad would come home, most days that I can clearly remember, I would go, and when he pulled up in the driveway, I would run home, open the trunk, and no bike. <laughs> Just, uh, my, uh, my father's routine with me as the youngest child was to get his briefcase and, and take it inside for him, take off his shoes and bring his slippers, and then he'd launch into one of those great dad stories that he always told. I, was all, I, was, I felt like every day I was, it, was, it was disappointing. Well, one day, he came home. I don't know how old I was, maybe I was six or seven, but I, same routine happened. I went to the back of the car, opened, he opened the trunk, and I looked in, there was nothing in there. He said, but I have a gift for you, jungle, right? What is the gift? And in the back seat was not a dog, was not a bike, but it was a dog. He got me a puppy. Didn't want that. <laughs> Not what I wanted. I wanted to be cruising the neighborhood, not feeding something. But he said to me, he said, I know you want a bike, but I got you a dog, and here's why. You're always out in the woods. You're always out in the bushes. There are snakes in this neighborhood. There are things that could harm you. A dog would do you more good than a bike. I said, all right. And for the next few years, sure enough, my dog River and I were best partners. You can ask my brothers. We were always out. Whenever I went fishing, whenever I went anywhere that I went, my dog was with me and a lot of the times warned me when there were animals that were, could have harmed me. I was grateful. Not what I was expecting, but what I got. This morning, we'll read a song about anticipation and fulfillment about the history of God's people, about God's character, about faith, and about lasting peace in waiting. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the central figure, recording, recorded as she's, she's singing a song in response to God's, to God's, just God's fulfilling promise that he had made to his people. Mary, the song in, in Christian church history is referred to as the Magnificat. Latin meanings, I, I magnify the Lord. It's, used, it's been used in Anglican and Catholic liturgies all through the years. Mary is a woman that I think sometimes gets overlooked um, as a woman of great faith, capable of being the foundation for the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to make three points this morning talking about what faith does, what deep faith does, what God does, in, in his promises and fulfilling his promises, and then we'll wrap it in a sense of what, what Mary is actually saying in this song that she sings. Deep faith brings lasting peace. Pick me up in verse 47. 
Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Magnifies meaning she, it, 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 her, her, God, her soul illuminates God. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Her grasp of her state in life, her grasp of where she is as a person that is in need of a savior, and and, and she expresses such humility in this song in her lowliness. She's visiting a cousin or aunt, Elizabeth. Mary's situation is contextual. If we contextualize Mary's situation, she, she has found out from the angel of the Lord that she is going to have a child and, and she says, I need to go talk to my family member about this. She isn't married yet. She is clearly at this point pregnant. Like they say in the hood, she's sure enough pregnant. So, so you can see it, right? <laughs> she's having, and having the message of the, of the salvation of the Lord through this child. Verse 32 says, he, this child that is in her womb will reign forever. She is echoing the, the, uh, the book of Chronicles and Psalms, Isaiah, this is a major message to give to a young girl. Mary risks being seen as she travels the village to go to see her, her relative. Mary, in this song, acknowledges God's holiness, his power, and his mercy. Mary is reflecting on things that God has done in her life in the past. I always ask myself, whenever I read people in the Bible who have such, God just uses them in a mighty way, and and, and they seem ordinary, but God uses them, I always ask myself, what was their prayer life like? What was their, what was her faith journey? She says, all generations will call me blessed. I was blessed, basically, to be the one that God chose. God shows his mercy through the generations, through Mary, to all people, to you and I, to all of God's people. He chose Mary. Mary is not here saying, why me? She is not here saying, why not me in a prideful moment? What she is saying is, despite me. I am lowly, yet you chose me. It is humility that she is expressing and the acknowledgement of the journey ahead. She is praising God who is almighty, who accomplishes great things through lowly, unlikely people. I know you hear this all the time, but the people that God uses to do his work are the least expected people. God uses believers. He uses unbelievers. For goodness sakes, Moses led the people out of Egypt and he had killed a guy. Esther was exiled from her was taken away from her family, but he used her to save the people. The disciples all had baggage. Paul was an unbeliever who killed people. And yet the message of God was brought through them to bring peace and a willingness, they had a willingness to follow God. God not only works through unlikely people, but he changes them in the process. Mary is being changed. Mary has a message that is so big, a child that is so important, that I, if you put yourself in her shoes, you, you can't imagine the pressure, the anxiety of what she's feeling at that moment in those nine months. Mary is not a, despite what we say, this spontaneous song that she sings, Mary is not a reluctant, random person. She is a part of God's plan for you and I. She's celebrating in the African-American church, in the black church, in the African church, wherever you want to, wherever people of color, African are gathered, they do this thing called a praise break. You might know that. You know what a praise break is? All right. Right in the middle of the sermon, right in the middle of a service, sometimes somebody will get up and just start praising the Lord. I'll keep going. <laughs> We family. I love y'all. 
people will spontaneously start celebrating and start singing. And some of those songs that they sing, they make up right on the spot. Some of them ain't good, but some of, <laughs> some of them are great because they're expressing a feeling of praise. This is, what, this, this is what Mary is doing here. She goes to see her relative and she's explaining what the angel has told her. And, and, and the Bible says the baby in Elizabeth's womb starts to jump when Mary walks in the door and they start praising the Lord together. When was the last time you broke out in a song of praise despite your circumstances? When was that time when you just, like, let it, like Americans say, let it all hang out and just be thankful for the Lord, just going out there? You feel shy? When I was in Civil War, we used to gather every day at noon, hungry as a mug, praising the Lord. We would, it would just because our lives, it seemed our lives depended on it. We would gather and we had, a, we, had a, we had a makeshift choir. I didn't get kicked out of that one because we was all there, right? And we, we, would, be, we would be singing praises, singing, uh, praying hymns and things because that's all we had. When you have, sometimes when we have too much, we forget where those things come from. Take a praise break once in a while and enjoy what God has done for you. Mary's next few things she talks about in verse 50 to 53 is God's character brings lasting peace. God's character brings lasting peace, verse 50. She's talking about God, she says, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good good things and the rich he has sent away empty. His mercy, his strength, God exalts the humble and brings humiliation to the rich and powerful. God's character has always been a complete reversal of our value system. We naturally want to prioritize the beautiful in our culture, the proud, the gifted, the the powerful. But God says, no, that's not how I work. I know you hear this all the time, but when in our lives, when, when certain people come to us as we show, we, we kind of we judge people based on sometimes what they look like, how much money they make, or where they are, how powerful they are. We make those judgments. God does not. Mary here is making a very revolutionary statement. I will fill the hungry, but send away the rich empty. This was not the case in the ancient world. The folks who could get away with all got away with what they wanted, right? Mary says, maybe we should look at the lowly, the humble, in a different way. Jesus Christ, who was to be born to Mary, right? God chose her. He did not chose He did not choose a Roman God. He did not choose one of Caesar's children. Not anyone from Caesar's lineage did he choose. Mary proclaims this because she realizes that God is working through her to be a part of God's plan and to know know that you are a part of God's plan is one of the greatest feelings in the world. Living in God's will, sometimes you feel invisible. God's character never changes. So he's still using people of humble backgrounds. He does this. He says he always will. The Israelites, at this point in history, you have to understand, have been waiting for the Messiah for centuries. People have been born and have died, and the Messiah has not come. It almost seems like a cruel joke, like God has promised us this person that would come would save us, yet this person is not coming. What is happening is that we are being invaded by army upon army upon army, and there are different people now ruling us. Where are you? He's finally coming. The angel has revealed it to Mary, and she is ecstatic. 
Mary is, this prayer, this song that Mary is singing, she's not singing just upon her behalf, but she's singing upon the, the, the community of people. She sees, she understands, Mary understands what this means, that the angel appeared to her, this girl, and says, the plan that I want to put in, in, into play here is going to come through you. Can you imagine that? If you're in Mary's shoes, how do you feel? The anxiety, the excitement, the nervousness. How do I parent this child that's coming? Am I even capable? How do I walk alongside this, this, this king of kings and lord of lords that, 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 that the angel said will be a great person? The pressure. All right, Americans joke and say, no pressure. I love that line, no pressure. He will be great, and he's going to come through you. God promises brings lasting peace. Ladies and gentlemen, verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, and he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. When you read that, it seems like just reading, you're reading the Bible. It's hard to get across. It's hard to understand, but let me break this down. This is where, this is where we'll spend most of our time this morning. God has fulfilled his promises to Abraham is what, is, what, is what Mary is saying. The verbs here, let me stop and say this real quick. Mary's prayer life, she has been around to understand the history of what's happening to her. She is, I want to say she is theologically informed. Because this prayer is so deep and has such depth that she's expressing, that this song that she's singing that she's expressing has so much depth. And let's go into it. The verbs here are what the Greeks call in the aorist tense, which is a simple past tense, right? You see it all over. You see it. He has helped, right? He spoke, right? Those are past tense. Nothing, nothing, nothing major there. But here's what it is. At the end of the sentence, it goes to the future. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, still in the past tense, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. God's promises are in the past, were fulfilled, are being fulfilled, and will be fulfilled all through this child that is coming. And Mary is communicating that. I'm here to tell you this morning, she's not just a vessel that God uses to, for, for Jesus to be born. She's actually a very thoughtful, prayerful person. Jesus, this baby that is coming, is going to fulfill so much. Mary, I think, must be incredibly excited. She understood what was happening, not just in the time now, but at the end of, the, the end of their oppression was coming. The Messiah was here. Those nine months, I can't tell you. The, the anticipation. I can't wait to have this baby because I don't know what he's going to do. Oh, my goodness. A proud parent, you can't, you, you, I can't imagine. The anticipation of a gift. The anticipation of things to come. It's not just an average kid that she's having. Simple things like, like how, am I gonna, how am I gonna parent this boy? How special is he going to be? What's my role as a parent? Right? How special is this child? Am I gonna guide him? Am I gonna be able to one teaching him to raise him? Is he eventually he ends up teaching her? On the other hand, she's seeing the blessings of a great heavenly God. You cannot shake her faith at this point because the angel has told her, and it is happening. Her anticipation for Jesus' arrival must be out of this world. The grace, God's memory, the gifts, the blessings, it must be an incredible time for her. As we sit in Tucson in 2022 and wait for Christmas, this Advent and remember Jesus' first coming to the earth. I want you to put yourself in Mary's place this time, right? Anticipation of a great blessing. God's promise will be fulfilled. God's ultimate promise 
to all of us is not just a gift under a tree. God's ultimate promise to all of us is the child that is going to be born, is Jesus Christ. The eternal impact of what Mary is communicating here is the heart of Jesus' ministry. Mary is communicating Jesus' ministry while he is still in her womb. I don't want you to miss that. I want you to hear this. Mary, in this song, is communicating Jesus' ministry while he is still in her womb. I'm going to walk you through really quickly just the verses we just read so you can see them for yourself. Mary knows the Holy Spirit is so on, I don't know how to say it, is so on Mary that she is communicating something that I'm not sure she's aware of, but I think she is. This child is coming. Here is where he's going to be. Go back up to verse 47. Mary is communicating that Jesus' ministry will be to magnify God, to rejoice that he is our Savior. Verse 48, she's communicating that he will exalt the humble, right? Through him, generations will be blessed. In verse 49, she is communicating that the great things that Jesus would do. In verse 50, he's, she's communicating the mercy that he would show those who love him from generation to generation. This child that is coming, in verse 51 and 52, she's communicating that Jesus' kingdom will be an upside-down kingdom that he will usher in. His exaltation of the humble and his opposition to the proud. This, verse 53, she is communicating his feeding of the hungry, part of Jesus' ministry. That he, he, you know this. He, he's, he's having, she is even talking about the conversations that he will have with a rich young ruler who walked away. Verse 54, she is communicating his fulfillment of prophecy for his forever kingdom. You can't tell me the Bible ain't good. Grammatically correct. You cannot tell me the Bible is not good. <laughs> it is the word of God that is indeed sharper than any two-edged sword. 32 years ago, right around this time, I, I, we were stuck in war and just everything was, was a mess. And, and finally, we were able to get out. And when we got on, we escaped on this rickety ship. You know, I was grateful enough to get on that ship. They didn't want me to get on the ship, but I had to, you know, we got on the ship. I'm leaving Civil War. I'm skinnier than I've ever been, and I'm on this ship. I don't know where this ship is going. My anticipation of peace was so high because all for the last year, almost year and a half, all I had seen was war. I was so used to war. Any loud noise, I knew I had to hit the ground. Anytime I heard a hint of food, I was on that line. When we arrived in the country of Ghana on November 8th, 1990, we started to hug each other because we, the anticipation had been like revealed. It, it still didn't click to me mentally that there was no war around me. There was peace. And there was lasting peace. Mary is sitting there having reviewed all of history and seeing war after war and kingdom after kingdom overtake them. And now here she is, seemingly insignificant, but the Holy Spirit is upon her that she writes a theologically just brilliant prayer or sings this brilliant song that Luke, the author of this book says in verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3 says, I took the time to go back and tell you these things to prove that Jesus is Lord. And he records this prayer, that, this song that Mary sings. And, 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 and it is so rich and deep with all these things that she's actually experiencing now and predicting that Jesus would do in the future. That is unbelievable. I don't know how else to say that. It is so rich. God's promise is being fulfilled to the people after these long years. I'm here to tell you now, ladies and gentlemen, you better get to know him. 
You better get to know Jesus. It is sweeter than you can imagine. When you read these little pieces of scripture and you realize the connection, the past and the present and the future and how people were seeing these things and they were happening before them, you know that what Jesus says about himself is absolutely true. He is the truth, the way, and the life. No other way. This is why I believe that Christianity offends and welcomes all cultures. Because the, the, the things that are, are so penetrating that it's hard for us to ignore. God's promise of salvation is what Mary is trying to communicate in this, in this song. She is communicating his covenant with Abraham, Noah, David, all these things are going to come to pass in this child that I'm carrying in this next nine months. You guys better watch out because it's going to be something else when this child comes. You and I are a part of waiting in anticipation for the second coming. We're in the same state where the Israelites were before Jesus came. Some people are impatient. Some are, are, are predicting wrongly. Right? Right? We're waiting, and we're tarrying, and he's going to come, and it seems foolish. It seems foolish, but God keeps his promises. In this time, as we wait, there should be lasting peace. We should be able to enjoy the peace of the Lord despite our circumstances. We should have incredible lasting peace. Jesus is the way to peace. In this season, as you wait and anticipate, wait and anticipate, communicate that clearly, that Jesus is where we find our peace. Would you bow your heads with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We honor you, we love you, and we praise you. God, we are surrendered to you. Lord, if there's anyone in here who needs to know you more, know to be introduced to you, or to be reintroduced to you, Lord, would you give them the courage to step up now, to step up sometime today, see someone, because you're too beautiful, you're too real, you're too true, you're too peaceful, you're too merciful, you're too graceful for us to miss. Lord, we love you. And we thank you. Amen.